Do you see the birdie? Yeah. Don't crawl in the dirt, boys. Hope everything works out and we're all happy and live happily ever after as much as that's possible. And I was like, where is she? You know, and he was like, I don't know. I instantly said to myself, what has he done? you have anything to say? Josh, will you give us a comment You're today? You're a person of interest, Josh. Even his own sister didn't believe him anymore. I just shoved Josh into the bathroom. And at that point, I was like, drop all pretense. Just tell me where her body is. Susan had often referred to her father-in-law as creepy. But she, I don't think, had any idea how creepy the man truly was. I can love you in a secret way. Can we can't talk about Susan or camping. I, I, I always think about her secrets. During that interview, it's very clear that Charlie has been coached. He looked more and more like a psychopath. He was running out of places to hide slams the door in her face and locks it. This is a story you can't write in Hollywood script. No one would have thought in a million years that's how the story would have ended. Susan Powell was a young, beautiful mother of two adorable children. She just one night vanished. Detectives have named Josh Powell a person of interest in the case. He did some local news, some ambush style interviews where they would ask him something on the fly. And You were camping with the boys? I have to go get my boys. But he never really sat down and, and talked about what happened. And I'll never forget the first time that I met him. I shook his hand, and a chill just, like, raced up through my spine. I just shook the hand of a killer. Are we rolling? Why talk now? <laughs> oh, man. I wanted to come out and say something. People who know me know that I'm a good dad. I was a good husband. I provided for them. Susan also contributed. Nothing he told me during that interview convinced me that he was not part of what happened to her and why she disappeared. I know that you've told police that you were camping. You brought your two-year-old and your four-year-old camping. Is that where you were? I'm not going to talk about anything that my attorney has specifically told me not to. OK. Why not just answer where you were when she disappeared? Judge, can I suggest something? His father was there, and his father really wanted to be interviewed, which was odd. And I had really no desire to interview Stephen Powell at that time, zero. And I just thought, this is such a waste of time. This is pointless. You think she ran away with another man? It, it, it was another man. I don't think Josh was in the room for that part of the interview. And before you know it, he ends up revealing the biggest bombshell out of all of the interviews that I've had done in the, uh, out of the, uh, the whole case. What makes you think that she would leave, leave her kids, her two young sons, and, and run, run away with another man? With another man. Susan was uh, very, very sexual with me. She was very flirtatious. I mean, she was just, she did it. I did, I mean, we, we interacted in a, a lot of sexual ways because Susan enjoys doing that. But this is I enjoy doing that. <laughs> Why are you telling everyone that? That's not to your benefit. But somehow, in my dad's own twisted mind, he thought that that was the greatest strategy to keep the dogs off Josh or something. I don't know. 
One day we were at a, an animal park. I was holding Braden in my arms, and I had my hands like this. And the part I remember is that Susan came over to take him from me, and instead of just reaching out and grabbing him, she pressed her breasts against my hands tightly and she wouldn't let my hands out. And that's nice, it was a cold day, so it was a nice, warm feeling. Give me a break. But he loved to talk about it. Josh and Susan, early in their marriage, move in to see Powell's home. Susan had often referred to her father-in-law as creepy, but she, I don't think, had any idea how creepy the man truly was. No, I'll do this. <laughs> and during this period of time, Steve Powell is constantly filming Susan. This is a man who is collecting video for his own perverse gratification. Because Steve Powell is a voyeur. He wrote a number of songs about Susan. Stephen Powell even recorded them and posted them on his website. I can love you in a secret way. I can love you each and every day. He had a pseudonym he used, Steve Chantre. While Josh and Susan were living with my dad, there was a point where she was alone in the car with my dad for a short time while Josh was in the house. And my dad actually hit on her. He has put his camera in the bag on the center console and left it recording. And so the audio of this conversation is captured. I really fall in love with you. You know, for the last year and a half, you're about the only thing I can think about. And it just, for example, when we were sitting on the couch, it just felt like you were very, um, you know, I, I mean, I was extremely aroused, and I think you were somewhat aroused, at least I thought. I don't know where you're going with this. That audio was an opportunity to hear Susan in her own voice telling Steve, in no uncertain terms, she was not interested. I'm kind of meaning to talk to you about this. And I realized the last time I came over that my own father doesn't kiss me and you, you kissed me and I didn't like that. She was extremely upset about that and disturbed but even more disturbed when Josh just said that that's his dad. I mean, he was obsessed with Susan. He was absolutely obsessed, and, and, and he wanted to talk about it. To me, this was the headline. And it also put a target on Stephen's back. And maybe he had something to do with this. The focus was less on Josh and it shifted straight to Josh's father because it was so creepy. That was my big takeaway. Police raided the home of her husband and father-in-law, seizing several computers and sealed boxes after those disturbing allegations made by both of them right here on GMA yesterday. Susan Powell disappeared from her home near Salt Lake City on December 6, 2009. Since then, no word, nothing. The Powells, they had this entire campaign of their own, and it was to make Susan look bad. It was to make her look like she was promiscuous, like she was looking to leave the marriage and abandon her children. Susan Cox kept a diary, a secret diary. Let's stay focused on the journals, OK? Because okay. I think that that's very interesting. I believe that Susan had a liaison with uh, somebody who disappeared the same week she did. She was very open sexually. And when I read her journals, it's clear that most of the male, the relationships she got into with males were ones that she initiated. Basically, Josh and Stephen, on their own stupidity, were telling, hey, this is, you know, the holy grail. This is telling us where Susan is. This is telling us how Susan acted. So that gave us the nexus through the judicial system to get into the house. When Josh moved in with his father shortly after his wife's disappearance, 
He took some things from his Utah home, including Susan's journals. Susan Powell's diaries have taken center stage. According to the search warrant left at the Powell's home, police came looking for seven very specific diaries, all written by Susan. Diaries that her husband insists will help explain her disappearance. They went through everything in the house, including all of Steve's, you know, files, journals, computers. They also find Steve Powell's collection of voyeur videos. Steve Powell is doing things like sliding mirrors under the bathroom door, attempting to get uh, images of Susan while she's undressed. I love putting her underwear against my face, just smelling her scent. Steve would narrate his videos to himself as he's shooting video of her dirty underwear. Stephen Powell would save things of Susan that she'd throw away in a bathroom garbage. Things like cotton swabs, wax strips, tampons. He would mark each one of them, like for specific storage. In his walk-in closet, there was a filing cabinet that was locked. And once we got into that, that was kind of like the unwanted treasure that we found. Police say inside Powell's bedroom, they found thousands of images of mostly young girls, many naked, being videotaped without their knowledge. Prosecutors say two former neighbors, sisters just seven and 12, were repeatedly videotaped while bathing. Police said Powell shot from his bedroom window into the neighbor's bathroom window using a telephoto lens. They've looked at Steve Powell's suspect and Susan's disappearance and ruled him out, but it's obviously of great concern to detectives as they're scouring through all the material they take out of Steve Powell's home when they see underage neighbor girls undressed on Steve Powell's tapes. Powell entered a plea of not guilty to 14 counts of voyeurism and one count of child pornography. Stephen Powell was eventually convicted and sentenced to five years in prison for possession of child pornography. Because of all the things that the police encountered in the search of the Stephen Powell home, it became apparent eventually these boys were at imminent risk of harm. The best part that came out of the search warrant with Steve's house was Child Family Services of Washington stepped in and shared with us that they would take custody of the children. The boys ages four and six were taken last night by the state and now Susan's father is fighting to keep them with him. They were going to be placed, relative placement with us, so we were the essentially foster parents. Josh didn't want them with us. My sons are safe with me. They're safe in my home. They're safe with my family. I think Josh's main fear probably was that once Charlie started talking to their grandparents, the story would get out. They were saying things like, our mommy went with us on the trip but didn't come back. We can only see our mom again if we go camping again. Braden drew the picture of uh, a minivan with stick people inside. And who's this? Oh, that's, that's me. Who's that? That's Charlie. Who's that? That's Daddy. And he said, and he volunteered, Mommy's in the trunk. We wanted to interview them. Will you sit right there? So I wrote the search warrant for that. Charlie, has anybody talked to you about your mom? Mm -hmm. No? I'm not know where she is. Mm -hmm. She got lost somewhere. During that interview, it's very clear that Charlie has been coached. His answers are extremely evasive. We can talk about Susan or camping. I, I, I always keep things as secrets. The only thing we got out of that time was that at one point he said that she went camping, and but she didn't come home with them. And and then he kind of clammed up after that. I didn't want to talk to you on this mom. I, I mean it on this many minutes. Now I'm done. While the Coxes were fighting for custody of the kids and had temporary custody of the boys, they were still essentially wards of the state. Washington state had control over these children and the Coxes were glorified foster care. So the boys are living with grandma and grandpa and Josh is getting supervised visitation with the boys. The visitation is at first understood to be taking place 
uh, at a secure third-party facility. But in short order, Josh takes steps to rent his own house, and he begins pushing the social workers, asking them if they can move visitation to this new house that he's rented, because it's not Steve Powell's house. It shouldn't have the same concerns. I think the boys were ones that originally told me, hey, we got to go to daddy's house or something. And, and I went, oh, really? <laughs> uh, I was concerned about that. They were very excited. They were thrilled about the new house. And they, they were thrilled about the yard at the new house. I am in their best interest as their father that I should be raising them. Through December into early January, he was confident that his reunification motion was going to be granted. Who has custody of your kids? Well, that was doomsday for Josh Powell. This is a story you can't write in a Hollywood script. No one would have thought in a million years that's how this story would have ended. Josh, is there anything you'd care to see on your way in? When Josh was fighting for custody of Charlie and Braden, it wasn't about being a father. It was about beating the Coxes. The kids seemed like typical kids to a certain extent, but they were undergoing a lot of stress. I think Josh went into that hearing on February 1st thinking he was going to get his kids back. I was pretty positive that Josh was the one that killed Susan. I wanted to keep those boys out of that home as long as possible. I was going to West Valley going, hey, guys, we need something. Pierce County authorities and investigators in Utah shared the common goal of protecting the boys. So the West Valley police in Utah passed along previously unreleased evidence recovered from the pal's home. When I pushed West Valley and they sent us the disc with the cartoon incestuous uh, images. The West Valley City Police Department in Utah had found images on a computer taken out of the house in Sarah Circle way back in December of 2009 that were of great concern. They were characters from popular Nickelodeon shows engaged in uh, sexual acts, acts of incest. The evidence was allegedly taken from Josh Powell's Utah home by investigators. They raised very serious questions about Josh's ability to be a safe parent for the boys. He denies ever looking at any kitty porn. He denies any knowledge about any of these uh, images that had purportedly been taken off of his computers. Illegal images? No. I asked Mr. Long, he saw nothing on there that he believed would be in violation of the law. Bad taste? I'll give you that from what he was describing to me. And that's when the judge ruled that the boys would stay with the Coxes longer. The images are enough that Judge Catherine Nelson is ordering Josh Powell to now undergo a psychosexual evaluation. This is an exam where they measure aberrant arousal. So you can't lie because physically the arousal will show if, if you're into things that might be illegal. He had to take psychosexual evaluation, which is one thing that I know it wouldn't pass, but it included a polygraph. That means that Josh is going to have to do what he's avoided doing from the very first days after Susan disappeared, which is take a lie detector test. He'd been able to get away with murder, so to speak, for a long time. But a polygraph, I think he was really afraid of. He didn't want to answer all these questions about Susan and how she went missing. He truly had gone down in flames from being pretty sure that he was going to get his kids back. Are you disappointed that he's going to be coming home with you? I think the arrow was taken out of him. He looked bad. You just saw his welfare diminish. He looked more and more like a psychopath. He was running out of places to hide, and he was running out of options, and it was tearing him down as a person. The custody hearing between Chuck and Josh essentially was put on pause. 
That was on February 1st. We know then that Josh spent uh, the next four days preparing. Uh, we know that he transferred some of his finances. He uh, gathered up some of the boys' things and toys, took them to Salmation Army and Goodwill. He bought five-gallon gas cans and went and filled them with gas. I said, look, I am afraid Josh is backed into a corner with the psychosexual and the polygraph. He knows there's no way he's going to beat those. So the morning of Sunday, February 5th, Chuck had gone to church early. I knew they were going for their visit, and they were making it clear to my wife and myself, uh, we don't want to see him today. No, we don't want to go. I picked up the boys. They were waiting with their grandmother, and I expected to return the boys in about four and a half hours. And things just go very wrong. The Pierce County Sheriff believes what has happened is nothing short of pure evil. This is a story you can't write in a Hollywood script. No one would have thought in a million years that's how this story would have ended. When you talk about a tragedy, this is it. So the morning of Sunday, February 5th, Elizabeth Griffin Hall arrived at the rental house, parked out front, and as children do, Charlie and Braden got out of their car seats. They rushed to the front door, which is what they always did. I was one or two steps in back of them. The kids just rushed in. I saw Josh for just one second. His eyes caught mine, and, and it, he had a look in his eyes. She looks him straight in the face. He slams the door in her face and locks it. I knocked, and I knocked, and I rang the doorbell, and I started yelling at it. Josh, let me in. And I heard him say, Charlie, I've got a big surprise for you. And immediately, she smelled gasoline. And she knew it was an emergency situation. I'm on a supervised visitation for a court-ordered visit, and something really weird has happened. I think I need help right away. He looked right at me and closed the door. All right, we'll have somebody look for you there. Okay, how long will it be? I don't know, ma'am. They have to respond to emergency, life-threatening situations first. The first available deputy... Well, this, is, this could be life-threatening. He went to court on Wednesday, and he, he didn't get his kids back. And this is really... I'm, a, I'm afraid for their lives. Okay, has he threatened the lives of the children previously? I have no idea. All right, we'll have the first available the deputy contact you. February 5th, 2012. Super Bowl Sunday. I went to church. I came home, Super Bowl Sunday. I remember watching the Super Bowl that day and seeing the reports come in. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John DiCepolo. We are interrupting your programming for some breaking news. And I got a call from my neighbor, and he said, change the channel. I was actually in Indianapolis. The Patriots were playing the Giants at the Super Bowl. Patriots lead the Giants 10-9 at halftime. And I was there with my family. And it was halftime, and Madonna was about to take center stage. As Madonna takes the stage to perform Vogue, Abby's in the stadium concourse trying to absorb the text she just received. I get a text, pops up on my phone. There has been a fatal explosion at the home of Josh Powell. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I thought, I I I'm going to get help from the neighbors. They'll be able to help me get the boys out. So I went screaming to the neighbors and said, there's two children in there. There's two children in there. I said, oh my god. And I thought, like, natural gas or something. And, and they said they found three bodies. There's a fire. The house exploded. And we're hearing that Josh and Charlie and Brayden were inside. This can't be. This can't be. And I thought, no, that can't be real. I would have heard something. And I called Susan's father. And I said, Chuck, is it true? Chuck, Chuck, is it true? Is it true? He said, yes. And I didn't even say goodbye. I just hung up the phone and started crying. And I was looking at a 
a house with steam still coming out of it and fires, and he went talk to his sergeant or whatever. He said, yeah, they're there, and they're dead. Honestly, I wasn't surprised. And the actions that he made after she went missing, I never underestimated him. And then to find out the details, it just breaks your heart. The Pierce County Medical Examiner says both boys had chopping wounds on their heads and necks, but that's not what killed them. The cause of death for all three was carbon monoxide poisoning. We believe he bought two five gallons worth of gas and one was used in the room where the boys were killed, where we found the hatchet, the boys, and one of the gas cans. And then after he had incapacitated them, he arranged them on the floor next to each other and poured gasoline on and around them and around the house. And then he sat on a gas can and lit a match. And they were still alive when the fire started and they died of smoke inhalation. And there was also gasoline in their lungs. Police say there's clear evidence Josh planned out this house explosion and meant to kill himself and his children. The morning of the 5th, he sent a couple of text messages and voicemails to people essentially saying goodbye. His sister Alina found one when it was too late to, to intervene uh, after the explosion. What did he say? I think he said, hello, this is Josh. I am not able to live without my son, and I'm not able to go on anymore. I'm sorry to everyone I've hurt. Goodbye. When you heard the audio recording, what did you think? What did you make of that? I thought he had lost all hope. To find out that you know, he used the ax first, and to find out that he said to them, you know, I have a surprise for you. Any little bit of doubt that anyone could have possibly had that Josh killed Susan had to have gone out the window, the fact that he could have done that to his kids. This wasn't tragic. This was deeply wrong. This was evil. You do not kill little kids. Police are convinced the explosion and fire that destroyed Josh Powell's home is a murder-suicide. I don't know anything else I could have done. And it, they're still dead. My daughter's still missing, and now the children are dead. I had them safe. They were in my care. They were gone. I was frustrated with the Child Protective Service Agency. Why would they put this single woman in charge of these boys and send her into the lion's den. They had the right to grow up. The Cox family is determined to hold the state accountable and make them pay for the deaths of their grandchildren. You cut that out of the tape, right? Okay, Braden. Hold still. That's the saddest part as you look at uh, photos of Josh and Susan, Charlie and Braden. You think about what could have been. Those boys deserved to grow up, and they never got the chance. We've been robbed of three precious lives, and it's just unthinkable that the same person did it. Why well, take the kids? Why? It makes absolutely no sense. My worst nightmare had just happened. But I went from praying that somehow Susan was alive to praying now that she was dead so that she could greet her boys in heaven. Outside the fenced off crime scene, strangers visit the memorial that has risen. Flowers, balloons, and stuffed animals offered in memory of Charlie and Braden Powell. Why would he go through so much to get custody of the boys only to murder them? Come here, Charlie. Here we go, Charlie. Hey, buddy. Well, one of the possibilities is he destroyed the evidence. Those boys were starting to talk. And by destroying the evidence, basically, he committed murder on his two boys. 
it shows how much of a monster he really was. And it shows how many people dropped the ball in this case. I was frustrated with the Child Protective Service Agency. Why would they put this single woman in charge of these boys and send her into the lion's den? It made no sense to me. I wanted to get the kids no matter what, I wanted to get the kids. If I could have gotten through the door, I would have. She did what she could. She did everything right. There's, there's no blame on her at all. Anybody who puts any blame on her is misdirected. The Coxes have filed a lawsuit against the state of Washington on behalf of Braden and Charlie. It's a wrongful death lawsuit, and their position is that the state of Washington put Josh's parental rights before the welfare of these boys. The Cox family lawsuit didn't include Elizabeth Griffin Hall or any other individuals as defendants. The fact is she, she was not the one that made the decision for this to be in the home. So to a certain extent, she's lucky she's alive. And she's, I think, a victim in a lot of ways, too. They filed this lawsuit, $35 million for Braden, $50 million for Charlie, $5 million for each minute that these boys suffered at the hands of their father before they were ultimately blown up in Josh's rental house. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. You have a civil case against the state that started in February, was disrupted because of COVID-19. Please now give your attention to Mr. Buck as he presents the plaintiff's final argument. It is out of the state's failure to live up to their own primary directive of assuring the safety of the children that this tragedy was born. What was the place that had the least protection? Josh Powell's home. What about the level of risk? Then the state learned of, this, of the boys' statements. It learned of this incest images. It learned that he was going to have to undergo a psychosexual evaluation, a polygraph. If the state had followed its policies, its, its guidelines, common sense, investigated, had visitations where it was supposed to have them, None of this would have happened. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this will be the only and final time that you hear from the state in this matter. The state took this very serious. They did their job. They followed their policies. Yes, the fact that Susan Powell was missing was known. But after more than two years after her disappearance, still, no arrest, no charges against Josh Powell. It actually takes facts and proof to remove a child from their parent, to keep them out of the home. The guides on visitation shows the number one preferred location is at a parent's home. That's why transition to a home occurs. The goal in these type of cases is always family reunification. I'm gonna to submit to you that Mr. Powell is the sole cause of the murder of his sons. It was not due to any negligence by the state of Washington. It was Mr. Powell who did this. The truth of the fact of the matter is, they're the only ones who could have protected the children at that point. They're the ones with responsibility. Has the jury reached the verdict, ma'am? All please rise. Please be seated. The court is reconvened. Has the jury reached a verdict, ma'am? If it pleases the court, we have. Was the state of Washington negligent? Answer, yes. What do you find plaintiff Charles Powell's total amount of damages? $57,500,000. Braden Powell's total amount of damages? $57,500,000. For eight years, the Cox family has been trying to find justice. And it took us a long time. And we took a long hiatus with the pandemic. Today, justice has been meted out. What I intend to do is uh, use uh, the award to try and help other people in, in that so that we can save more children. Jury members told ABC News 
They didn't believe any one individual at Child Protective Services was responsible for what happened. They blame a systematic failure for the tragedy. It just came down to this. You cannot have reunification, you know, as your goal at the expense of child safety. And, you know, lawsuits change things. Brown versus Board of Education, Roe v. Wade. I mean, that's how things change. So 2020 reached out to several agencies in both states, and they declined to comment or refer us to other departments. In the end, we were unable to get an answer to our questions. Could the actions of these agencies or their inactions have contributed to the murders of Braden and Charlie Powell? It should have never have got to the point where you had Josh getting his kids into that house and blowing it up. I think that it is just one of those cases that will always kind of have a place in Utah's consciousness. And I think a big part of that is we still don't know what happened. We still don't know where Susan Powell is. Does everyone believe that he harmed his wife? The answer is yes, that's what everyone believes. But what you believe and what you can prove are two different things. Josh's actions are definitely a, an admission of guilt. She's gonna divorce him. If he can't have her, nobody will. So he kidnaps Susan and most likely murders her and disposes of her body. Where, nobody knows. The last that she was seen and heard from was her friend Yovana was there at the house. And Josh, who never cooked, made pancakes for dinner. People think he poisoned her, of course, because he made him separate. She felt sick and sleepy. Giovanna Owings saw that, and then she's never heard from again. I know there are 10,000 abandoned mines in Utah. That's a lot of places where you can dump a body. There's so many theories, I don't know which one it is, but I guarantee you. Susan Cox Powell did not leave that home willingly at midnight to go camping. This was a family that was not known to the West Valley City, Utah Police Department. They had never been called to the house. But in other ways, Josh was just a classic abuser. He was controlling. My heart absolutely breaks for Chuck and Judy Cox. Think about what this couple has gone through. They lost their daughter. Both of their grandbabies were horrifically butchered. And the only three people that could shed any light on this are dead. Her story will continue to live on and inspire others to move in the right direction, to move towards good relationships and get out of bad situations, abusive situations. Mm -hmm.